Saga Navakad, also known as Sargon the Great, the Great King, was a Semitic Akkadian emperor famous for his conquest of the Sumerian city-states in the 24th and 23rd centuries BC. The founder of the dynasty of Akkad, Sargon reigned during the penultimate quarter of the 3rd millennium BC. Cuneiform sources agree that he was cupbearer of King Urzababa of Kish and some later historians have speculated that he killed the king and usurped his throne before embarking on the quest to conquer Mesopotamia. He was originally referred to as Sargon I until records concerning an Assyrian king also named Sargon were unearthed. Sargon's vast empire is thought to have included large parts of Mesopotamia and included parts of modern-day Iran, Asia Minor and Syria. He ruled from a new, but as yet archaeologically unidentified capital, Akkad, which the Sumerian king Lys claims he built. He is sometimes regarded as the first person in recorded history to create a multi-ethnic, centrally ruled empire, although the Sumerians Lugal and Mundu and Lugal Zagasi also have a claim. His dynasty controlled Mesopotamia for around a century and a half. He is a well-known king of the Akkadians origins and rise to power. The exact date of Sargon's birth or even death are unknown. According to the short chronology, he reigned from 2270 to 2215 BC. These dates are based on the Sumerian king list. There is discussion among the Syriologists over whether or not the name Sargon was given at birth or a regnal name adopted later in life, given its directly relevant meaning. The story of Sargon's birth and childhood is given in the Sargon legend, a Sumerian text purporting to be Sargon's biography. The extant versions are incomplete, but the surviving fragments name Sargon's father as Laobam. After a lacuna, the text skips to Azababa, king of Kish, who awakens after a dream, the contents of which are not revealed on the surviving portion of the tablet. For unknown reasons, Urzababa appoints Sargon as his cupbearer. Soon after this, Urzababa invites Sargon to his chambers to discuss a dream of Sargon's, involving the favor of the goddess Inanna and the drowning of Urzababa by the goddess. Deeply frightened, Urzababa orders Sargon murdered by the hands of Belis Tikal, the chief smith, but Inanna prevents it demanding that Sargon stop at the gates because of his being polluted with blood. When Sargon returns to Urzababa, the legend breaks off at this point. Presumably, the missing sections described how Sargon becomes king. The Sumerian king list relates. In a gauge, Akkad, Sargon, whose father was a gardener, the cupbearer of Urzababa, became king, the king of Agade who built a gade. He ruled for 56 years. There are several problems with this entry in the king list. Thorkel Jacobson marks the clause about Sargon's father being a gardener as a lacuna, indicating his uncertainty about its meaning. Urzababa and Lugal Zagasi are both listed as kings, but separated by several additional named rulers of Kish, who seem to have been merely governors or vassals under the Akkadian Empire. The claim that Sargon was the original founder of Akkad has come into question in recent years, with the discovery of an inscription mentioning the place and dated to the first year of Inshakushana, who almost certainly preceded him. The Wadena Chronicle states that it was Sargon who built Babylon in front of Akkad. The Chronicle of Early Kings likewise states that late in his reign, Sargon dug up the soil of the pit of Babylon and made a counterpart of Babylon next to Agade. Van der Meerup suggested that those two chronicles may in fact refer to the much later Assyrian king. Sargon II of the Neo-Assyrian Empire, rather than to Sargon of Akkad. Sargon survives as a legendary figure into the Neo-Assyrian literature of the early Iron Age. Tablets with fragments of a Sargon birth legend were found in the library of Ashurbanipal from the 7th century BC. According to this legend, Sargon was the illegitimate son of a priestess. She brought him forth in secret and placed him in a basket of reds on the river. He was found by Aki the irrigator who raised him as his own son. 
formation of the Akkadian Empire. After coming to power in Kish, Sargon killed the king of Kish. After having the army of Kish follow him, Sargon soon attacked Uruk, which was ruled by Lugal Zagasi of Umma. He captured Uruk and dismantled its famous walls. The defenders seem to have fled the city, joining an army led by 50 Ensis from the provinces. This Sumi reinforced fought two pitched battles against the Akkadians, as a result of which the remaining forces of Lugal Zagasi were routed. Lugal Zagasi himself was captured and brought to Nippur. Sargon inscribed on the pedestal of a statue that he brought Lugal Zagasi in a dog. Collar to the gate of Enlil, Sargon pursued his enemies to Ur before moving eastwards to Lagash, to the Persian Gulf, and thence to Amma. He made a symbolic gesture of washing his weapons in the lower sea, to show that he had conquered Sumer in its entirety. Another victory Sargon celebrated was over Kashtabila, king of Kazala, according to one ancient source. Sargon laid the city of Kazala to waste so effectively that the birds could not find a place to perch away from the ground to help limit the chance of revolt in Sumer. He appointed a court of 5,400 men who he knew would stay loyal to share his table. These 5,400 men may have constituted Sargon's army. The governors chosen by Sargon to administer the main city-states of Sumer were Akkadians, not Sumerians. The Semitic Akkadian language became the lingua franca, the official language of inscriptions in oral Mesopotamia, and of great influence far beyond. Sargon's empire maintained trade and diplomatic contacts with kingdoms around the Arabian Sea and elsewhere in the Near East. Sargon's inscriptions report that ships from Magan, Melara, and Ilman, among other places, rode at anchor in his capital of Agade. Sargon also knocked down every wall and destroyed all depictions of the previous kings. The former religious institutions of Sumer, already well known and emulated by the Semites, were respected. Sumerian remained, in large part, the language of religion and Sargon and his successors were patrons of the Sumerian cults. Sargon styled himself, anointed priest of Anu, and, great ENSI of Enlil. While Sargon is often credited with the first true empire, Lugal Zagasi preceded him, after coming to power in Ummah he had conquered or otherwise come into possession of Ur, Uruk, Nippur, and Lagash. Lugal Zagasi claimed rulership over lands as far away as the Mediterranean, while various copies of the Sumerian king list credit Sargon with a 56, 55, or 54-year reign. Dated documents have been found for only four different year names of his actual reign. The names of these four years describe his campaigns against Elam, Mari, Simurim, and Uruar. His Akkadian dynasty continued another century after his reign. Wars in the northwest and east Shortly after securing Sumer, Sargon embarked on a series of campaigns to subjugate the entire Fertile Crescent. According to the Chronicle of Early Kings, a later Babylonian historiographical text, Sargon captured Mari, Jarmuti, and Eblar as far as the Cedar Forest and the Silver Mountain. The Akkadian Empire secured trade routes and supplies of wood and precious metals could be safely and freely floated down the Euphrates to Akkad. In the east, Sargon defeated an invasion by the four leaders of Elim, led by the king of Awan. Their cities were sacked, the governors, viceroys, and kings of Susa, Barhash, and neighboring districts became vassals of Akkad, and the Akkadian language became the lingua franca of the entire region. During Sargon's reign, Akkadian was standardized and adapted for use with the cuneiform script previously used in the Sumerian language. A style of calligraphy developed in which text on clay tablets and cylinder seals was arranged amidst scenes of mythology and ritual. Later reign The epic of the king of the battle is known from an Akkadian language tablet in the Armana archives. Translations have since been discovered in 
Hittite and Hurin. It depicts Sargon advancing deep into the heart of Anatolia to protect Akkadian and other Mesopotamian merchants from the exactions of the king of Puriashanda. It is anachronistic, however, portraying the 23rd century Sargon in a 19th century milieu. The story is thus probably fictional, though it may have some basis in historical fact. The same text mentions that Sargon crossed the Sea of the West and ended up in Kupara, which some authors have interpreted as the Akkadian word for Keftiu, an ancient locale usually associated with Crete or Cyprus. Famine and war threatened Sargon's empire during the latter years of his reign. The Chronicle of Early Kings reports that revolts broke out throughout the area under the last years of his overlordship. However, Leo Oppenheim translates the last sentences from the east to the west he, i.e., Marduk alienated from him and inflicted upon that he could not rest. Later literature proposes that the rebellions and other troubles of Sargin's later reign were the result of sacrilegious acts committed by the king. Modern consensus is that the veracity of these claims are impossible to determine, as disasters were virtually always attributed to sacrilege inspiring divine wrath in ancient Mesopotamian literature. Legacy Sargon died, according to the short chronology, around 2215 BC. His empire immediately revolted upon hearing of the king's death. Most of the revolts were put down by his son and successor Rimash, who reigned for nine years and was followed by another of Sargon's sons, Minishtishu. Sargon was regarded as a model by Mesopotamian kings for some two millennia after his death. The Assyrian and Babylonian kings who based their empires in Mesopotamia saw themselves as the heirs of Sargon's empire. Kings such as Nabonidus showed great interest in the history of the Sargonide dynasty, and even conducted excavations of Sargon's palaces and those of his successes. Indeed, such later rulers may have been inspired by the king's conquest to embark on their own campaigns throughout the Middle East. The Neo-Assyrian Sargon text challenges his successes thus. Another source attributed to Sargon the challenge, now, any king who wants to call himself my equal, wherever I went, conquered, let him go, family. The name of Sargon's main wife, Queen Tashlaltum, and those of a number of his children are known to us. His daughter in her Joanna, who flourished during the late 24th and early 23rd centuries BC, was a priestess who composed ritual hymns. Many of her works, including her exaltation of Inanna, were in use for centuries thereafter. Sargon was succeeded by his son Rimash. After Rimash's death another son, Manishtishu, became king. Manishtishu would be succeeded by his own son, Naram Sin. Two other sons, Shu and Lilanil Arba East Takal, are known. Comparisons in ancient literature Similarities between the Neo-Assyrian Sargon birth legend and other infant birth exposures in ancient literature, including Moses, Kana, and Oedipus, were noted by Otto Rank in 1909. The legend was also studied in detail by Brian Lewis and compared with a number of different examples of the infant birth exposure motif found in European and Asian folk tales. He discusses a possible archetype form, giving particular attention to the Sargon legend and the account of the birth of Moses. Joseph Campbell has also made such comparisons. Sargon is also one of the many suggestions for the identity or inspiration for the biblical Nimrod. Ewing Williams suggested Sargon based on his unification of the Babylonians and the Neo-Assyrian birth legend. Yigal Levin suggested that Nimrod was a recollection of Sargon and of his grandson Naram-Sin, with the name Nimrod derived from the latter.